2001 A Space Odyssey is a 1968 visual poem directed by Spartacus's Stanley Kubrick, or Kubrick, if you're still in film school. A million people can take a million different things from this film, and that's on purpose. It was so revolutionary that it gave birth to an entire generation of Spielbergs and Lucases and Dennis Murins, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go back to 1964. Beatlemania is in full swing, America is currently, well, continuing to invade Vietnam, and NASA is planning on how to land astronauts safely on the moon. That year, Stanley released Dr. Strangelove, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb, a film satirizing the Cold War between America and the then Soviet Union. A film that was supposed to come out in the tail end of 1963, but as a result of the assassination of John F. Kennedy, the studio altered some scenes and shelved the film for six more months, holding it until 1964. That's always been happening as it turns out. It was at that point that young Stanley Kubrick set his sights on making a science fiction movie, a genre he, by all accounts, f***ing hated. He hated it because all of the sci-fi movies at the time looked like this, or this, or this. Science fiction was a bit young and silly for his tastes. Spaceships or flying saucers and all that. He wanted to see space as it was and to use the slightly dusty film genre in a new way. Film was about changing minds, man. The crew got to work to hit a target they didn't know the location of. This is the starting point for science fiction movies as we know them today. We had the blob department with all these boys and girls in there, breathing heavy uh, industrial uh, solvents of one form or another. Stanley and his team just designed spaceflight as an extrapolation of current technologies. Stanley Kubrick and his art director didn't hire the artists that science fiction and Hollywood was hiring at the time. They hired engineers. Reinvent the way we think about designing space. Every ship has a story, every switch a purpose, designing life in space. They were imagining how a filmmaker could shoot space. This film is entirely revolutionary and also a rousing, if at times sleepy, masterpiece. And in 1968, the year before the United States landed on the moon, they let the world see it. Which is where this gets interesting. Many critics were vocally unmoved, we'll say. 2001 was seen as boring, pretentious, its ending indecipherable, and yet a vibrant bouquet of cinematic artistic expression. People low-key kinda loved it and no one really knew why. The film and the Arthur C. Clarke novel of the same name were written essentially at the same time. They wrote the story together and the story was based on an earlier work from Arthur C. Clarke called The Sentinel, which is essentially the birth of the monoliths as a concept. The full novel gives you all the lore about the monoliths you could ever want, who built them, why, but to Kubrick, explanation is prison purposely deny the audience a definitive understanding of events by excising important information. Then they must interpret it. The monolith in this film is open to interpretation. It gives knowledge, but it's a big scary thing we find sometimes and don't necessarily understand the ramifications of what it's giving us. Incoming controversial statement film as an art form isn't always about answers, and that's Kubrick talking, not me. We weren't always the bottomless content vacuums that YouTube and Netflix have made us. There are artists on the other side of that screen. Technology in this film gives humankind the idea to kill other humans, and also technology made humankind kill technology. I'm afraid. Teenagers in the 70s used to smoke a bunch of weed and go see this movie then hang around and like, talk about life and stuff, man. To sum up his approach to filmmaking the best I can, the more you say, the less you say. <laughs> Frankly, we have had some very reliable intelligence reports that 
quite a serious epidemic has broken out at Cleves. And this is a film where the actors were a little confused by Kubrick's direction, oftentimes telling them to be more robotic in their line delivery. When David disassembles Hal, Hal is begging for his life. I'm afraid. And David has to tune that out. Whoa, machines made us like machines anyway, man. Whoa. 1968 wasn't ready for this, and sci-fi almost immediately takes the most action-packed elements of this movie and supercharges them into, well... It made back about five times its budget. It was a success. To put all of this into a historical context the best way I know how... But did you know? Rock Hudson and 250 other people walked out of the premiere of 2001 A Space Odyssey. Oh, sorry, I gotta think about shit and stuff? Nah. We'll be talking about this movie for the rest of our lives. Its place in film history is inexorable. But time has a funny way of evolving the meaning of things. Watching this film this year was a touch surreal. Technology's monolithic savior complex? Check. Humankind's propensity to trust things that hurt them? Check. AI's seeming indifference to human life? That's a bingo. Capitalism's blind adherence to the bottom line in the wake of a supposed epidemic. Okay, look, this movie is kind of like 2020 bingo, or shall I put it a different way? 2001 A Space Odyssey portrayed scientists operating on the moon before humanity had actually landed on it. Think about that for a minute. Science fiction is as influenced by this movie as this movie was influenced by actual scientific breakthroughs that were happening concurrently. Science fiction begins to imitate real life. It's kind of a wild moment in time to think about. Time periods get idealized, the rough edges sanded down by the winds of history. Did you know that the astronauts were still in orbit around the moon when the first conspiracy theories began to circulate that the landing itself was faked? They hadn't even landed yet. The earliest theories were just expressions that the technology could not have possibly come that far that quickly. I couldn't do this, so no one could do this. The eternal human refrain. If you ever find yourself in need of a pep talk, especially over this next year, remember these words. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Imagine trying to visualize walking on the moon before anyone had actually done it. Jeffrey Unsworth, the director of photography on 2001 A Space Odyssey, also shot Superman 1 and 2, A Bridge Too Far, A Night to Remember, and of course, Cabaret. <laughs> Ray Lovejoy, the editor for 2001, was the associate editor on Lawrence of Arabia. 2001 was, in fact, his first job as the full-time film editor. And to illustrate, imagine being associated with the two most famous film edits of all time. It is recognized that you have a funny sense of fun. Ray went on to edit Kroll, The Shining, Batman, and Aliens with James Cameron. These two individuals solved all kinds of hard problems in their travels. We choose to do these things because they are hard. I think Kubrick benefited from being a reclusive mystery. It created this mythos that his virtuosity was reclusiveness and not having a team of geniuses standing by to actually deliver on cutting edge breakthroughs when he needed them to. 2001 was a time of confusion and discovery in an artistic medium that we don't get to relive. This was the moment that birthed a new age of science fiction. The struggle of any film is connecting with an audience. 2001 connected with an audience in a way that none of Kubrick's other films did. It woke up an entire industry and inspired so many leaps forward in cinema, it's impossible to list them all. We still measure ourselves against it. When the artist is gone, all that's left is the art. I think movies exemplify that because it takes so many people to make them. 2001 is a piece of art created by a lot of people, including Arthur C. Clarke. I think it's difficult not to have an emotional connection to 2001, even if that emotion is complicated. 
It takes time to figure things out. It was art that mattered to the industry beyond the expression it contained. It is an ephemeral scream into the void.